This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. In each episode, we bring you information, insights, ideas, and interviews from some of the industry's top thought leaders. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic and guide the show. This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. I'm your host, Jamie Wood, and our topic today is relatively timely in what's shaping up to be a pretty massive disruption in the market. The topic is selling media in a weak economy. Now, I've always said the true test of a great media salesperson is not what they do in a buoyant market, but rather how they choose to respond to difficult revenue conditions. Right now, I know there are a lot of media salespeople around the world struggling with some significant professional headwinds brought on by a weak economy. In an industry where our very livelihood depends on our ability to generate revenue, this can be particularly anxiety-inducing. I thought it was important to address this topic in detail, so this is a very special episode, and I'm very lucky. Um, I've reached out to a friend of mine called Josh Bustide. Josh is the Chief Commercial Officer of the Arabian Radio Network, one of the United Arab Emirates' largest and most successful multi-platform media organizations. They're doing some really innovative work over there in terms of tackling the current market dynamic, and I wanted to get him on the phone just to talk through what are some things we can do to tackle this thing head on. It's going to be a very important episode, really, really keen to make sure that we're delivering value, so please reach out to me if you want us to cover anything else around this topic. The first five. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Well, thank you for making yourself available on short notice. I I thought, you know, you'd be a really good guest to get on the show in light of what's kind of unfolding around the world at the moment. Um, and today is specifically around the topic of, you know, selling in a weak economy. But before we sort of jump into it, Josh, I'd love for you to just share with the audience a little bit about yourself, your background and your experience in the media industry. So working backwards, I'll, I'll, this will now give away how old I am. But uh, working backwards, so uh, my my career actually started in sports marketing uh, back in the very early 90s. Um, and then uh, media, I spent a lot of time working with media um, and then made the conversion into media with ARN, actually, uh, in the early 2000s. I spent a great six years at the ARN University, then uh, spent uh, another five years at DMG, well, now Nova Entertainment, and then finally, uh, Fairfax um, for a short stint um, in the in what was you know then Fairfax, and then moved to Dubai to take up this role uh, in 2012. So uh, just coming up eight years here as the Chief Commercial Officer of uh, ARN Dubai. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, you were kind enough to host me there for a coffee and a chat a few years ago and very impressive operation and, and facility in a, in a really dynamic market. And I suppose um, the reason why I thought you'd be a guy to talk to, mate, is, is today's topic is all around you know generating revenue in a, let's not say a weak economy, but in an economy that's being disrupted. And it feels really topical right now with everything going on. Um, I'm curious to know, what are you seeing in the Middle East right now? What's the outlook for the quarter ahead? Yeah, it's funny. I just left a meeting uh, with our chief operating officer and our CFO, looking at it. And and to be honest, it's a it's a fair bit of uh, how long's a bit of string or a bit of a crystal ball at the moment as to what you see. I mean, I think you know certainly still even at the start of this week, we work a Sunday to Thursday week, and we literally started our annual acquisition program that we do with the guys from Boost Media here. We've been doing with them for twelve years, and we started that last week. And we're on our major event set up in uh, in Dubai at one of the five star hotels here on Saturday. We still had a record revenue day, and by the time we got to that night, we were shut down. Um, so, you know, planning ahead at the moment, we're in a market that decisions are being made overnight, and uh, you know that has massive impact on the next day. We haven't seen, you know, we've probably lost in our current revenue. We've probably lost about fifteen percent. Um, of people, predominantly from the events industry. Obviously, um, you know, we're the epicenter of the Middle East here and we host a lot of events, you know, obviously from the entertainment end, Mm. but also massive conferences and massive uh, industry events that are held here, obviously, which is an important revenue stream for us. So the bulk of that's come from revenue. I think the vast majority of clients are in a wait and see approach at the moment where they're looking at 
you know, how long it is. We're currently in a situation where uh, all the decisions that have been made on what's being shut down and what's being told not to open, et cetera, is now through till the 1st of April. So um, once we get to the 1st of April and then whatever announcements come on the back of that, I think we'll have either a positive or a more negative impact on people's outlook. Yeah, and it's um, it's interesting here. I think in Australia, we're really only coming to terms with it after the weekend. You know, I, we were out doing a road show for the last three days of the week last week, and, and you could somewhat see it unfold in real time over 72 hours, people going from shaking hands and being quite cordial with one another to, you know, people actually actively avoiding getting in a, in a boardroom with more than 20 people. So it's a fair to say it's unprecedented in terms of what we're in right now. And I think You know, the reason I wanted to enlist your expertise on this podcast is we're dealing with a a lot of people in this audience where their very livelihood depends on their ability to generate revenue, irrespective of market conditions. So I'm very happy to have you here today. Let's jump into the main topic and uh, see if we can help some of the audience out. Media Sales Mastery. Let's talk about mindset. What I was really interested to to hear from you, Josh, and I know this is sort of your skill set in terms of leadership, you know, in a weak economy, it's very easy to focus on the doom and gloom, but can this be reframed right now as an opportunity? And if so, how? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think everything we do uh, in terms of media sale is around belief. Um, you know, I think we work in an industry, um, you know, it's a dynamic, it's a fast moving industry, but ultimately clients still today, whether they're coming through an agency or they're coming direct, is they're buying belief from their rep. And that's an understanding of has the uh, has the rep understood the challenges that my business has is facing, and have they been able to put a great solution in that I believe will solve those problems? And you know, we are in a problem right now. And the reality is, if I'm running a restaurant, I'm running a car yard, I'm running a bank, I have I face the same challenges. I need customers into my store to keep turnover up because I I have costs that are still going out. And so I think a rep's job is to not talk about the issue because there's plenty of people on social media, either qualified or unqualified, who are going to talk about the issue. I think what we need to talk about is what's the solution to the problem, both in a short and a medium term scenario. And to do that, you know, we have, I've got a hundred guys working in commercial here in our office in Dubai. and, And the conversation I had with them yesterday is do not use the word you know, the the magic C word, do not use it. We need to be able to talk to the client about what it is that we're going to do for them to drive business into their business. And if, uh, you know, if, if the client's hearing or reading or seeing on social media 400 negative posts, and as a byproduct of that, we're the only person who's actually talking to them about a positive solution, they will listen to what you have to say because you're the only person who's speaking differently to the rest of the people. And I'm not saying we avoid the scenario or we hide from the reality of it, but we, you know, we, you know, certainly in a market like we're in here in Dubai, 65% of all business is SME. You know, the balance 35% is business and government. It's just the reality. We just have to speak like that. And so that's a really good reframe, I think, because you're right. We we are fundamentally solution selling is kind of the central tenant of most media salespeople. It's an enterprise sell. It's it's bespoke to that client at that moment in time. And you're right, in terms of providing a solution to a problem, we we definitely have, you know, a big problem in front of us. So let's expand on that. You know, we're we're in a weak economy. It can be very I'm not going to say tempting. It can actually just be very easy to bunker down and try to set more realistic goals, um, you know, in a new context. And this is so the salespeople don't get demotivated. Is this the right approach or, or do you actually think that right now it's about getting on the offensive and setting more ambitious targets for the salespeople? Yeah, look, I think it's about setting realistic targets and I think the, the realistic means neither pessimistic nor, nor positive. I think the reality is it's about setting what we think is achievable. Um, in, you know, that, as I said, that was the exercise I've just left to come in and do this podcast and give them something that's reachable, but certainly in terms of the KPIs that we set to deliver it, they need to be ambitious. You know, we're doing twice a day video conferencing with the team on a remote uh, work from home basis at the moment. And as part of that, we, you know, the my line management team are going directly with their teams on their KPIs from the day, from the calls, from the follow-ups, from video meetings, from face-to-face meetings to understand it. So I think 
we have to be on the offensive in terms of the work that we're generating, but we have to make reachable targets. And the reality is the targets that um, we had set uh, for this year in the current environment um, are not achievable, certainly in the short term. And you know, when we when we all work in an industry where a percentage, and in some cases a significant percentage of your income, uh, is hinged to commission performance, you need to make them um, tough and reachable, and you have to perform to get them. But they have to be in sight. So that's often a very delicate balancing act, um, and uh, one I think we've got right for the coming eight weeks for our guys. Um, but very very strong on making sure that they're delivering their KPIs. And I think that that sounds to me like a really nice balance between those two kind of natural opposing forces there. Let's talk about the P word, pricing. You know, a tough market discounting seems to be the primary approach that that a lot of people, and I'm not just saying this is media sales, a lot of people take to converting business. What are some of the other approaches that a media salesperson can implement at the moment to help create value, you know, mitigate financial risk, help to close out an opportunity without degrading our yield because we know we're going to get through this and to rebuild our yield position is going to be very difficult if we actually look too short-sightedly at the problem. Is there anything that's working for you guys at the moment in that sense? Yeah, look, it's to be honest, it's an ongoing challenge for us here. We uh, you know, we're in a we're in a heavily deregulated audio industry here there's 48 commercial radio stations in in a population of 9 million so we take about 70 percent of all revenue so we are the dominant player here but our competition believes in one commodity and one commodity only and that's price so on a given day before the situation we were probably four or five times more expensive already than our competition so we're now in a situation where that you know what was four or five times by the end of this week might be ten times uh, we might be ten times more expensive, but we have in my opinion we have to take a long term view. If we believe in the value of our product, we believe in the value of our audience. It has a value, and as long as you're practical um, in terms of what your pricing is relative to the performance of that product, and you can develop a creative solution that elicits a response, then people should pay. If you don't believe in your product or you're unsure about the value of your product or you're unsure of the value of the idea that you've developed on your product, then you enter what I call a commodity exchange, where it's selling potatoes or tomatoes or bananas. And we're not. We're absolutely not. Um, I believe in the value of our product, the value of our talent, the value of our audiences and the scale of our business. And to do so, that has a value. So whether the spot in breakfast on uh, on Virgin is uh, you know a thousand dollars a spot, and our competition's at a hundred dollars a spot. Do I believe that the audience delivers that thousand dollars? Absolutely. And whether we have an ongoing uh, in, uh, environmental issue, whether we have an ongoing uh, virus issue, whether we have an ongoing economic environment issue, it's still worth it because the audience is still there. You know, um, you know, the audience is still listening to us in their cars. They're still listening to us online. They're still listening to us on their phones. Um, that hasn't changed. In fact, you could argue in times like this, one of the most trusted mediums is the uh, is radio in terms of getting updated information and, and correct information. So to be honest with you, Jamie, my last port of call is always price. Um, I'm a believer and, you know, it's probably my early days at ARN when we weren't quite as successful as the ARN that you now that you now operate in. And if you focus purely on price, then you're a commodity and then you're hinged to the performance um, at all times. So if things are good, then your price goes up. If things are bad, your price goes down. But if you're um, if you have value in your product and you and you believe in your product and you believe in the process that you go through to develop that idea, Price will always be a factor, but I think people get very hinged to the price of a spot. In my opinion, the most important piece of information on a presentation is the bottom right-hand corner. And the bottom right-hand corner is how much is this going to cost me in total? And then how much is that then do I need to invest to get an elicit a response that's going to convert into the KPIs that I've set for the performance of this campaign? So whether the, the spot costs 1000 500 800 they need to trust us um, because it's for me, it's about the total investment. If the total campaign's $100,000, well, 
well, then I know what I need to be able to do in terms of customers to make that a worthwhile campaign. Whether the spots are 1,000, 500 or 100 is, is a byproduct that I should trust the media company to elicit. So... Um, yeah, that's 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 my. View. It's always been my view, regardless of good times or bad. No, and I look, I completely agree. I mean, I think a natural sort of extension of that is that value is somewhat in the eye of the beholder, and a weak economy, you know, can have a really sudden impact, a pretty drastic impact on different clients and industry verticals. I mean, you you talk about the event industry, you know, we're seeing it in travel here, we're seeing it in retail, certainly events as well, and. The question, Josh, you know, particularly when you've got a revenue line that is so heavily geared towards some of these categories, how might this impact the media salesperson's approach to actually deciding where they allocate their time? You know, uh, it can be very, I think there's a little bit of cloudiness in people's minds going, you know, is my priority to protect the revenues that are there and to support the clients that are having a tough time? Do I need to go find new categories that are actually you know, somewhat on the up and I can tap that growth? Do I need to straddle this middle ground? You know, is there any sort of guidance you might give to the audience around how to potentially allocate their time in a market where it's fluctuating like this? Yeah, I think think it's relative to what your budget looks like. So if, you know, if at the start of the month, 40% of my current revenue comes from existing clients and I spend 40% of my time making sure that they're still there. And then if 60% is new business, then I need to invest 60% in new business. So I, th- I don't think that changes. What I think changes is the conversation that you're having. So again, you know, talking to our teams over the last 24 hours, again, the conversations with existing clients that we had wasn't around you know, oh my God, the coronavirus, oh my God, this, oh my God, oh my God. The conversation with was them was going to them with new creative executions that are relative to their brand position in tough times. So, you know, to give you an example, we two of our largest clients are Emirates and Etihad, both very large clients of ours and obviously very hinged um, both at a government level but also at a, a community level in, in, in our town. Both of them, even though their flights have reduced by 90% globally, are still investing the same amount that they did that they did eight weeks ago because we went to them and we said, this is the time now that you need to be able to communicate with the audience about what it is you're doing to make the clients who are still flying safe. But also importantly, a huge portion of people in this town work for both those airlines. So they need to go to let everyone know that they're taking care of the pilots, the stewards, the mechanics, the engineers and whatever else in, in an industry that's under flux. And I said, the money that you spend today in assuring the audience that you are great guys, you're committed to the welfare of communities, you're committed to the welfare of your employees, will return in spades when uh, when the skies are clearer. Um, and, and they both bought into that. So I think... From a rep's perspective, in terms of the conversation you have, it's relative to what your budget looks like on a you know on a month in month out basis. But I think it's also switching off and finding um, reliable news and reliable business articles and uh, and and social media or networking platforms where you can look at those industries where you think there are opportunities. You know, for example, in the last 24 hours, Amazon's put on 100,000 employees globally to meet the demands of what their business looks like in the short to medium term while there might be some limitations on buying from traditional retail. So that's a conversation that we need to have. Now, thankfully, here we share the same building as Amazon, so that's a pretty easy conversation. But as a byproduct of all of those situations, you know, it's talking to a it's talking to a restaurant about, you know, maybe you won't be able to get the 100 packs in per nine, but we can certainly get it out to them. So then ramping up their delivery messages. So there's there's lots of conversations that you can be having with clients that aren't specifically talking about the issue, but are specifically talking about what could be the solution for them. And I think that's a really good point to hang on, you know, even right now where we're sort of at the, the front end of this thing, and I dare say cancellations are the first you know, the first port of call that a lot of people are contending with, how do I actually protect the revenue coming in? The next piece is going to be around how do we adapt creative? You know, how do we how do we find a way to change the client's message out to reflect what's currently happening and to have them take a market leadership 
position. And then the next part is going to be around how do we actually position advertisers to capitalise on a return to normality once this is all over with. And so it's it's really encouraging, Josh, to hear that you've you've identified some industries already that have that need. You know, the, the motor industry here, interestingly, just today, all of the different kind of contacts that I know in that market segment are actually saying their inquiry has increased. Um, off the back of people avoiding public transport, we've seen a massive growth in the demand for motor vehicles. So, you know, I think it's it's important to look at not the immediate impact on the category, but to look at what the actual related impact will be for other industries and really try to get to the insight. It's what it's what really good media salespeople do. They look for that human truth and that audience insight and they find a way to leverage that and, and substantiate a campaign with that. So, um, you know, it, it's probably a good precursor to this question, which is that we have a lot of people right now, they're in a difficult market, and some people might be panicking. Some people might be defaulting to survival mode, you know, coming in and reacting to the day, reacting to external factors. And my sort of long held conviction has always been a structured, disciplined approach to good sales process is critical all the time, but more so in times like now where we actually need to have a level of consistency and hygiene to what we do. I mean, would you share that sentiment? Absolutely. And I think even more importantly than that is what good salespeople look for is good leadership. And I think like all organizations, uh, people look to the, you know, their line manager, their director, their chief commercial officer, they're looking to someone to say, this is what I need you to do. And then I, and then they're expecting you to do the same thing. And they look for leadership, they look for someone that gives them a strength of conviction that says this will be okay, this is what we're going to do and we're all in this together. And I think those organisations that panic, that make their, their staff panic, and when their staff's panicking, there's no way a, a panicked sales rep can effectively communicate with a panicked client and get them to move forward. So I think, you know, one of the roles of... Uh, you know, management in an organization is to obviously we have to deal with the realities of the situation that we are and we need to have closed doors meeting and we need to build contingency plans. But certainly the people that are sitting beneath you are looking to you and they're looking at you in the white of the eyes and asking you, is this going to be okay? And you need to set them on that path. And if you give them that level of confidence, then they're able to give that level of confidence um, uh, to their people. I mean, I, I forwarded it to you earlier today, Jamie. We put out a, a three-minute video um, that we've put out across all of our social channels and also across uh, across media here in the UAE. And that video basically says we're big. We've been around for a very long time. Uh, the industry has supported us, and now's the time for uh, us to support the industry. Um, we're here. We'll continue to support you. Let's have a conversation around how we can help your business because that's what we do. You know, whether the market's plus 20, the market's minus 20, we have a global recession, we have Y2K, we have COVID, you know, you name, we will be here. I mean, you know, I, I always refer to radio as as the as the cockroach of the media industry even a nuclear bomb couldn't kill it you know if you so we will always be here um and we're a, a reliant reliable process system but I, at the, as i said it's reliant on the leadership of your organization right here and right now i've been running sales teams for about 7 years now and and i have to say the one thing that's always fared well for me is is clarity of message over communicate and speed of decision making are really critical times right like right now and being able to have a clear vision and to actually take control of what you can you know so much of media sales in my view is actually how people choose to respond to factors beyond their control or outside of their sphere of influence and you know i i i choose to take an optimistic view here because i'm seeing around the world organizations like yours take a market leadership approach here and I guess, you know, in, in drawing upon some of your previous experience, Josh, I mean, you reference Y2K, you reference some other sort of, you know, the GFC. Have you seen a weak economy actually be the catalyst for business growth within a media sales team or organization um, in your experience? And if so, I'd love to know an example of that. Yeah, look, I mean, I think in all that, I mean, you know, I mean, Y2K is probably the biggest scam I've ever seen in the history of the world. So let's not reference that. But the reality is it had the same panic that we are now seeing. I mean, I think the reality of the situation, and, and you know, let's let's be very clear. I'm not a doctor. I'm 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 not making any assertions about anything other than this is the first time in human history 
that the reason this has grown so rapidly in terms of scale is two things. One, we no longer live in a world filled with borders. You know, people can be on a plane and be on the other side of the world in the same day. Number two, we are now infinitely connected across the globe on an immediate basis. You know, what we had inherently relied on in the past was, you know, a newspaper in the morning, a newspaper in the afternoon that would tell us what's going on. Now, you know, 33 times a second, you're getting updates on what's going on all over the globe from all over it. So whilst that has many positive um, benefits and many positive applications, it also has a huge risk of scaring the world rapidly. And we're now living through that scenario at the moment. There's no question this is a serious health issue and there's no serious, you know, the governments need to react but also it is also creating a lot of fake news, a lot of spam news and frightening a lot of people in directions they don't need to be. So again, I think it comes down to the communication that salespeople are having, the communication that they're having with their clients needs to be correct. It needs to be based on their business. It needs to be based on what we can do with our audiences to help their business. They're getting enough information on the current scenario that I just don't think it's relative. And if you look at the same scenario in the GFC, I mean, my, my favorite scenario or my favorite story from the GFC is what Hyundai did in the US during the GFC. And obviously there was huge panic, rightful panic in, in the US at the time about job losses and people were obviously very concerned that they were going to lose their jobs, therefore not purchase a new car. Hyundai was desperate for growth at that time in the US in terms of market share and trying to steal it off American made or Japanese made, which had the lion's share of market in uh, in the US. So they were the first to go out with if you lose your job, we'll buy the car back and pay whatever it is that you now currently own. And so you'll have no debt and we'll take yeah. the car back. And as a byproduct of that, in that year, they grew 15% market share, um, not only in terms of direct cor correlatable sales return, but as a byproduct of that, their brand positioning changed dramatically from a challenger brand to a leader brand um, because they were prepared to back their product they were prepared to back the country in which they were operating. And so Americans who are, you know, obviously very proud and very proud of their country and very proud of people who support it, embraced Hyundai because they were backing it in the way that GMC or Chrysler weren't. So, you know, that's my favorite because that takes a real strength of courage, that takes a strength in belief in your product. And that takes a strength and belief in the country and that you're operating. So, you know, um, that's my favorite because I think that's a translatable story um, in any global scenario that you're in. You know, the, the thing about that, Josh, that's really interesting too is you do ask the question, why does it take something as big as a GFC to actually drive that kind of innovation in, in marketing? It's, um, I mean, testament, hats off to them. It, it's a, a bold strategy. I recall that campaign very well as well. Um, but I think, you know, the message here for the audience is this is an opportunity to really sharpen your skill set. You know, we are in solution enterprise selling. Arguably, we've got a big problem that our clients are tackling. Now is the time to actually walk the talk with what we do. I can't ask my sales manager that. This one is an interesting one, Josh, because you've obviously covered this a lot, but I want to read this question to you because this is reflective of a lot of the listener submitted questions I've been getting in the last two weeks. So I'd love to read it to you and then let's reflect on it in real time and see if we can help this individual. Now, they've, uh, they've, we've held their name. They've actually sent this anonymously through the website and it goes like this. Hey, Media Sales Mastery Podcast, can you talk a little about the coronavirus and what the right approach to dealing with clients is? My sales manager has the mandate of business as usual. She's pushing me out to market with no budget relief when half of my clients are talking about temporarily shutting their offices and completely pulling their current advertising activity. New business is even harder. I've been selling media for nine years, but I feel really uncomfortable at the moment trying to prospect clients who I can tell are really struggling. I know we need to be doing our best right now, but it feels really uncomfortable to go out and persuade people to buy advertising in the current environment. So what's your initial reflection on that if somebody came to you and, and then brought you that, that issue? Yeah, look, I think we, we, there's, there's two obvious issues there. One, um, their line manager um, is not assessing the situation correctly. I just don't think you can say it's business as usual when it's not business as usual. So I think that person's craving for leadership in their own organization. He talks about new business prospecting, 
you need to be prospecting relative to those in the current environment who can still have a challenge that needs to be met. It's about stepping back from traditional business and saying, oh, you know, oh, that restaurant, you know, we're, under, we're going to be under lockdown, so that restaurant's not going to serve. Okay, that is the short-term answer. The long-term strategy is then how do we get this person's fantastic product into people's homes safely, hygienically, and swiftly? That's message. You know, that's simple message. But if you believe in your head when you're hearing every phone call that you're making, both internally and externally, starts with, oh, it should be business as usual, and why aren't you making 25 phone calls and why aren't you doing 15 face-to-face, it's just not reality. It's absolutely not reality. We need to acknowledge that we're living in a, a in my opinion, a short-term scary situation for lots of people that has been hyped up beyond all belief across social media and we need to acknowledge it. So we need to acknowledge it internally in our own organisations and if our people believe that we're doing our best to protect them as individuals but also recognise that we have a job to do and help and support them in that process by being part of that process with them, by working with them on clients, by getting the creative department involved in that process from a very early stage, by creating work groups where we're brainstorming categories, while we're reading business uh, websites, we're reading LinkedIn as opposed to Facebook and Instagram, then you'll be in a position where your headspace is dramatically different. And in my opinion, 50% of everything a salesperson does in a day is based entirely on their headspace. And 50% of that 50% becomes part of the headspace of the organization that they operate in. And, you know, I've never had the pleasure of, of, uh, of working directly with your CEO, Kieran, but certainly what I've seen and what I've been able to watch is the ARN that I knew from the early to mid 2000s is a very different one to the one that Kieran has run. And that's about culture, that's about belief, that's about positivity, that's about backing the organization and backing your people. People are a byproduct of that. You know, at the end of the day, we spend more time working in an organization and spending time with our teams than we do our own families. Would you would you expect your own family to not be concerned? Would you expect your wife, husband, children not to be concerned? On Sunday night when I arrived home, I have four children and my, my youngest, who's 11, when I walked in the door late at 10 o'clock, he was sitting in bed with my wife and he said, Dad, you know, how many, um, how many people have got it today? That's his opening question. He's 11. Yeah. His second question was, are you losing sponsors? On He, he thinks everyone's a sponsor. He doesn't understand just straight advertising. <laughs> Is, are you losing sponsors on the radio station? Are you going to lose your job? That's an 11-year-old, you know? And the reality is, does he have a phone? Yes. Does he have a MacBook? Yes. Do his friends have one? Yes. So we live in a world where if we, you know, if my 11-year-old thinks that way, the 32-year-old sales guy working in one of my teams who's got a wife or a husband and two kids and supporting a family somewhere else in the world, absolutely they're concerned. Absolutely they're stressed. So our job is to make them feel safe, protected, that we understand the challenges and we expect them to give it everything they've got, but under a new world order where we're developing ideas and concepts to deal with the situation. Because if we don't believe it's a situation... Then, uh, then, then we have absolutely no internal structure in place to support that person. I think that's a phenomenal answer, Josh. And I, I just want to hang on that point, you know, about about your your youngest there, where you're saying, you know, being aware of what's going on in the world. I mean, children don't have the cognitive skills to or cognitive development at that age to really fully understand what is going on. Um, you know, the the bushfires in Australia were a great example of some of the disaster coverage going on as well. And and that extends to junior members of the team in, the, in our organization as well. I mean, somebody who's a graduate, this is their first foray into media. And, you know, I've got three graduates um, that currently sit in my team. We've got to be very careful with how we actually communicate and message to those people because they don't understand necessarily what the actual current context is. They've never really even been exposed to a corporate uh, work environment, much less one that is dealing with some significant headwinds. So, you know, my headspace is similar to yours in that so much of, of coming in and doing what we do, you know, the mental battle needs to be won and fought at the start of every day from every person because if your people don't feel strong, protected, fortified, 
and and able to go out to market and proudly have a really consistent message, um, fundamentally, you, you're not going to have any success off the back of that. So look, Josh, if it's okay, um, this individual may want to follow up and, and have a bit more of a chat to you. Um, would would it be okay if, uh, if them or anyone else in the audience could reach out to you um, at this time? Anyone, particularly from Australia, it's going to, it seems like it's going to be a while till I get home. I haven't been home in 12 months now and it doesn't look like I'm going to get home anytime soon. So uh, any Aussie out there and I have no network allegiance, so I'm happy to, happy to have a chat with anyone at any time. <laughs> Well, mate, look, we thank you for your time. What I'll do is I'll put a link to your um, LinkedIn in the episode description for anyone who wants to reach out. I can really vouch for Josh, guys. He's, he's an absolute legend. Um, mate, you're a phenomenal leader. I really respect uh, what you've built over there. I really respect the fact that you've given your time so generously when clearly you've got a lot of other stuff going on in your organization and your, your sales force of over 100 people. Um, Josh, is there any sort of parting thought you want to leave with the audience before we go out there to the world and uh, and tackle what is going to be an interesting three to six months? Yeah, look, I think all I'd say is, you know, at the end of the day, we will be okay. You know, this this will come, it will be bad, there will be some impact. There is no question about that. And, you know, I just think people need to take care of their families, take care of your teams, take care of your colleagues, um, be sensible in what you do, be proud of what you do. And if you work for a great organisation, then you work hard for them. If you don't think you work for a great organisation that's not dealing with this situation well and is, is, is not embracing, then you need to look for a new one. You know, the reality is that, uh, you know, I've worked for some great organisations, I've worked for some great leaders, and I've worked in some poor ones. And I've been lucky and fortunate enough now to be in a great organisation who's, you know, everything we do at the start of the, you know, Mahmood, who's the general manager here, a local Emirati, who's my boss here, opening line from him to me every single day for eight years has been, Josh, how is your family? Yeah. That resonates with me. At the time, I didn't understand it. That's perhaps not a, you know, a, a normal thing to do. And now that that's the reason I've been here for eight years is because, yeah, he knows I work hard and he knows I put in and get results for this organization and help build this organization for him. But at the end of the day, he actually genuinely wants to know that my family is okay because that at the end of the day, that's what we do this for. I do this to put my kids through school and give them a life experience and then help them get on with their lives. So, you know, as I say to my guys all the time, we're not curing cancer and we're not putting a man on the moon. We're helping uh, our clients meet new audiences and help grow their business. That's it. So let's not make this any more difficult than it needs to be. Well, it sounds like the family and the workforce are in safe hands there with you, my friend. I thank you very much for your time today and I wish you the best of luck. Thanks very much, Jamie. Take care of yourself, man. You've been listening to Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic, guide the show, and don't forget to subscribe to receive new episodes each week.